Hi, it's Monday, it's three o'clock. Welcome to Together Unlocked. On this very, very hot day in August, it's over 30 degrees here in the June 90s studios in East London. I'm Drew Gosling, also known as the artist June 90. I'm artistic director of Together 2012. We're bringing you this program today as part of our web-based join-in from home program of inclusive accessible activities. With me in the studio today is the artist Julie Newman, our chair. We'll come back here for a bit of audio description in a minute, but first to the other end of our very long virtual sofa in equally hot West Midlands are... Yeah, hi, good afternoon. I am Robin Sergener. I am the business director at Together 2012, and I am known as the artist Angry Fish. Uh, it is, you are right, it is extremely warm here as well. Not quite as warm as it is in London, I'm aware of that. And there's gaps between the buildings here for some wind to or air to get through. Um, so today I'm, I have my lovely shiny uh, new white haircut. I'm wearing some nice no-rimmed glasses. Um, um, and on my body I have a, well, I do have trousers as well, but for those who are watching, I have a black polo neck t-shirt, no, black polo t-shirt, sorry, um, with um, a, a white logo that says Angry Fish Training Arts and Empowerment. I am Josh Sergeant. I'm a PhD research student and one of the hosts of Together TV. Um, I have kind of swept mid to long length hair that I'm learning how to style uh, as it gets a little bit longer. Um, and hopefully with the sun, because uh, it tends to make it lighter, that by Wednesday it will be uh, end the, the discussion of ginger or blonde, because it will be fully blonde by Wednesday. Strawberry. Um, there's a little bit of sun and a little bit of soap will go a long way to brightening it up. Um, but then that, I have a, a pink t-shirt with white writing um, and no glasses. And, and I did spot him combing lemon juice through his hair. Well, I do you know, funnily enough, I was going to say a little bleach is a marvellous thing. We're into <laughs> ginger power here because Julie, though she will describe herself slightly differently now, I was born a redhead and I am a hennaed redhead. I have a short hennaed crop. Originally courtesy of the dog's clippers, I have managed to buy some human clippers, so that's a bit of an upgrade for me. Um, but the thought of sitting there after I'd cut it with a bag full of henna on my head was not attractive, so it's still a bit of a work in progress. I've got black plastic glasses, black wrist braces, silver jewellery, including in view of the summer, a little fish pendant round my neck. Well, skeleton would be more accurate. And I've got a blue T-shirt on that says Tobago West Indies. In fact, we were due to go to Tobago in February to view the carnival and work with carnival artists as part of our carnival arts programme. And it mysteriously fell through, and I was so pleased. But I'm wearing this today, thinking it's going to be at least that hot in Tobago at the moment. And when we get there in two years time or wherever that might be i'll bring you guys back one as well only a boys one julie what do you look like uh today i'm sweating i'm <laughs> a very hot person with a little red face i've got um silver and gold hair dark rim glasses a very boring white t-shirt but very serviceable i think in the heat Yes, not to mention the fact that as we haven't had any social care support since February, we haven't really done any mining either. So it's a little bit difficult to tell whether it's all just crumpled in the heat. But yes, indeed, we are melting. And before we go any further, since we have the well, the benefit of Josh's company a lot, thanks to COVID, because Hooray. otherwise he would be in Sheffield studying full time. His subject, brilliantly, is how the body deals with heat. So you talked quite a lot on Friday, which was great. Give us the highlights as to how to stay safe in the heat, because it's going to carry on till at least Wednesday. Yeah, so a couple of really simple things that you can do. Um, it's drink little and often. So rather than having kind of the, you know, chugging a pint of water, have a, a bottle of water that you can drink continuously throughout the day. Um, to kind of keep your hydration up. Um, if you're wanting to cool down, 
uh, crush up some ice cubes. You get kind of little ice chips that you can um, pop into your mouth. Um, or if you want to try and cool your skin down, um, damp cloths or damp flannels kind of around the neck. Um, or kind of immersing your hands and feet into water is a really good way to cool down. Um, but if you are going to do that, then have it as kind of room temperature, so it's kind of tepid water, um, rather than it being cold water. Um, even though you might get that kind of initial feeling that you've cooled down, if you've got really cold water, you'll actually get a, a longer benefit if you have um, not warm water, but kind of room temperature water. Um, yeah, it'll actually help the bod the whole body cool down um, a little bit better rather than just kind of shock cooling that one area. And it's some um, because you're very much coming from an athletics perspective, you're a sports expert. You know when they talk about cold showers, not in terms of sport, but just generally, and then it's supposed to really brace you, is that because it brings the blood rushing and actually makes you hotter? And is that one of the reasons to do tepid water? Um in terms of kind of ice showers and ice baths in sport, it's to do with recovery and um, kind of muscle recovery and, and things like that. Um, in terms of cooling down, um, if you use uh, kind of room temperature water, um, what it will do is it will stay on the skin and then it will draw the heat out of your body to evaporate. That's what sweat does, essentially. Um, is it draws the water out and then you that's how you cool down um if you were to have really cold water um it's going to take that initial pull of heat to get rid of it but then your body responds to all of a sudden you you know your arm and your hand being really cold um in that it thinks you are cold so it's going to kind of try and keep the warmth in whereas if you have room temperature water your body is going to go it's going to think you're warm and then you're going to keep kind of pumping that heat past the the water, to, which will then draw it out and evaporate and then that will cool you down. And um, and I think that is a serious point because lots of people would get under a freezing cold shower. But also from my perspective, in another life, I collect girls' school stories, particularly the Shallow School series. In the school stories of the 30s and 40s, they leapt into their cold baths and it really warmed them up. So I was thinking, yes, that cannot be the case. If you're if you have a school story that's set in the Alps and the snow and they're having cold baths, then they must warm you up as opposed to cool you down. But I never quite understood why till you explained uh, it. it I, well, I'm going to say, because it makes you shiver. Apart from anything else, the process yeah, the, of shivering is it, actually warming you up. Yeah, if, if you think of when you're cold, all of the responses that your body does, if you suddenly get into really cold water, your body's going to do all of those things to try and heat itself up. So if you're trying to cool down, you don't want to heat yourself up. Um. I'm going to come back to you for a few more practical tips, but just could I make a link for the rest of the week? We are back on Wednesday and Friday as usual from 3 to 4 p.m. Josh will be talking more about sports and different topics then, along with virtual gaming. I've actually lost the point of that link, but that's because it is just so hot. Josh, tell us some more. And um, in particular, I've got a high blood pressure. It's not the only reason why COVID would not deal with me very well, but presumably there's a range of medical conditions where you really shouldn't exercise at all in the heat. It, it, it's difficult to give... One, I'm not a medical doctor, so I, I don't want to give any advice it, it, everything that i'm saying is a, is a suggestion purely um you know don't if, if you have any questions or anything phone your your gp or, or whatever um or nhs 111 or, yeah, or, or 111 or kind of where you, you know um don't necessarily google stuff because if you google anything <laughs> it will come back to the worst condition you could ever think of is always the top result um so yeah avoid google especially if you've got any anxiety um but yeah in in terms of um exercising in the heat it any sort of physical activity makes you warm um muscles working generate heat um so doing any sort of kind of exertion and, and, and physical things is going to cause you to heat up um 
obviously if you do have like you mentioned around kind of high blood pressure and things blood pressure will affect how you um kind of regulate how hot and cold you are and um, it's all to do with kind of blood flow and um, that it gets into some very kind of complicated does one cause the other type things um, and the best now, thing would that's be... where I remember the link. On a Wednesday, we have poetry and we have the Together Pop-Up Poetry Club. This group has now, over the last month, successfully moved to becoming a phone-based group and is running again. And we invite you to write along with their themes. The theme for the poem this week is positive and negative at the same time. And it seemed to me when Josh was talking about all of the kind of tepid water and cold water and it does this and it does that, I thought this has to be around the kind of the heat and this kind of dichotomy. Judy, could you explain a bit more about how this theme is going to work for anybody who th feels like staying in and writing a poem today and tomorrow? I think it works individually. Um, you can you can have opposites as you as you just pointed out. So you can have heat and cold. Um, you could also have good and bad. Um, uh, you can have um, a range of of opposites that perhaps a little bit off the wall. I'd say that sort of without really knowing what else to say. Mm -hmm. If you have something that's <clears throat> sort of like come in to your mind because you think it's interesting, um, I think if you explore it a little bit, you'll probably find there's another aspect of it. It's like flipping a coin. There's another side to it. And I think that's really what Alison was, was wanting us to think about was, the, the good, the bad, <laughs> the indifferent, the ugly, whatever. Uh, but, you know, sort of being able to to look at something from different perspectives so that, you know, you, you can consider extremes, but you can also consider what's in the middle. And my only question after that is, it was really hot last week. I don't know how you guys didn't come up with something really, really simple, but it sounds like a fascinating theme. So on Wednesday, we'll be hearing from the Pop-Up Poetry Club. We'll see what they've written on that theme and see what anybody else has. We wanted to stick a little bit with health before we come on to other things, but just to flag those other things up, on a Monday, we talk film, we talk photography, and today is no exception. We quite often talk dance, but I think it's a little bit hot to be dancing today. And around half past three, we'll be showing you a short film about our um, Join In From Home program and the activities you can do around the photography, filmmaking, and so on. Josh, did you have any more tips for us before we move on in terms of staying safe in the heat? Because that's our first priority. Yeah, I just wanted to come back quickly to what um, Ju, you were asking about kind of exercise and things. Um, we've talked a lot about how exercise can be really good for physical health and mental health. Um, with the temperature, how it is at the moment, if you are fit or, or relatively fit, whatever that means for you, and um, you know and you kind of understand how your you know how your body reacts then you know continue to do exercise if you want to making sure you are you know drinking plenty or drinking slightly more than you would normally and um, just obviously because you're going to sweat more and um, because of the heat and um, but if you aren't kind of used to exercising particularly and um, but you feel like you want to do something it, it's fine to start but make sure you take it really really mm. slowly um you know be, be really cautious because yeah you aren't going to have that fitness already but also kind of you're not going to have as good a kind of sense of, of, of how you're feeling whereas if, if you're used to kind of exercising you can kind of go okay I'm, I'm starting to struggle now I can take a, a rest you know I'll know when to drink but if you kind of don't have that then you might think oh I'm just tired from exercising whereas actually it might be a slightly more serious kind of heat related yeah. thing. And I heat. think that everybody, and I think it is everybody, who is also having to do tasks around the house, quite often tasks we would have had assistance with before COVID, 
it is exercise too. Um, I got up about seven because it was, which is not early for many people, but is early for me, just because if I was going to do the chores, we absolutely couldn't wait. Then I wanted to do them when it was cool as possible. If it can wait, it should wait. When does the temperature start dropping? Wednesday night, Thursday no, morning? It's going to stay high all week. I checked it before before we came on air. The, the the promised thunderstorms and rain is is being pushed back further and further down the week. I just think maybe we should be a little bit more continental. You know, we should have a little rest at, at lunchtime and get up early, as you suggested, and do things that need physical energy sort of first thing. At night, there's some beautiful skies about, I understand. It's not quite so easy in London, although the moon was shining quite brightly last night. Uh, nonetheless, if you if you do a little bit of exercise in the evening and go outside and sit and just gaze at the stars, there's all sorts of meteor breaking. Uh, you know, there's lots of things to see in terms of, of uh, the night sky. And it's worth checking it out. It, it's also it's a nice way to get a bit of fresh air. Yes, I think that's right. Kind of. And it's the same with the house, you know, having lived, albeit quite briefly, on in continental Europe, I shut the house up tight as a drum all day in terms of windows and curtains and things. And then as soon as the temperature drops, that's when I open it all up, air it, capture as much cold air as possible and keep it for as long as possible. And now, COVID is rising around the UK. We need to get it back down again because we need to get our kids back to school particularly uh, wonderful EJ Surgeoner off camera in the West Midlands because she's just spent a fortune on school uniform. She needs to put it on. So I've been talking quite a lot in Newham recently to people running community champion schemes and all sorts of schemes to make sure that everybody has as much information about COVID as they need to stay well. We would also point out, of course, and I will put our crawler on, that if you stay home and stay creative as much as you possibly can, that is also a good way to stay well. But I thought, as I've got you all in the studios melting away, and I have to be here as well, I'd give them a bit of a test. We always say, or the surgeon has always claimed to be the most competitive family in the world. So I'm going to make Josh the... Um, the teller, if you like, because he might cheat, but this is going to be personal. It's not going to be Josh London would never versus cheat. Birmingham. Josh does not cheat, no. except when he was racing. Yes, I was going to say, for anybody who's just joined us this week, come along on Wednesday, watch our Clockwork Paralympics for the right of the teddy bear to wear a medal and see what you think. But in the meantime, a starter for one, a covered symptom. Have I got to do this as well, or am I just keeping score? You, um, you can do it as well, but come on. Loss of smell. So you can just tally her for one. Uh, uh, fever. Persistent cough. Aches uh, and pains. Sore throat. Diarrhea. Uh, rash, Stomach pain. Discoloration of the toes and fingers. Yeah, COVID toe. Yeah. Um, headache. Trunctivitis. Uh, so you're supposed to do it one at a time. Oh, sorry. So you're not supposed to be reading it off the iPad in front of you. I'm not. What? He's not. I can assure you, he's not. <laughs> <laughs> it's an email from you. He's on my computer. It's got the schedule on it. Yes, dear, oh dear, oh dear. So the government adverts. How many symptoms do the government adverts claim there are? About twenty. Uh, they list the three main symptoms, or the three Thank most you, Josh. Symptoms. Well. Julie, you were wrong, but the World Health Organization list, it depends how you count them, around 13 or 14, and indeed, in fact, let me get the World Health Organization, can you just hang on to that a sec while I open it up? Oh, look, look, they've got an iPad with the Yeah, they're reading it, it off the iPad. <laughs> oh, but <laughs> I'm on the WHO. Using you forget I am the quiz master, or should I say... <laughs> So the most common symptoms of COVID are fever, dry cough, and tiredness. Now, if you read the government posters, you would think it was fever, cough, loss of sense of taste, 
loss of sense of taste or smell. But in fact, being tired is the third most common symptom. And of course, some people only have one of these symptoms. Aches and pains, nasal congestion, but not sneezing, headache, pains elsewhere, conjunctivitis, sore throat, diarrhea, rash. Now, the rash is really interesting because with the kind of rashes we're used to, like eczema, you get them on the insides of your knees and the insides of your elbows, but the covered rashes are on the outside. And on top of that, there is something called covered toe, which can also be covered finger, as I think Josh was just saying. And that's where you end up with one or more bright red toes or bright red fingers. And that may be the only symptom you have. Now, the system for getting tested is not... I think it wouldn't be unfair to say not quite working as well as it's hoped to be as yet. And at the moment, that testing, for various reasons, is based around just three symptoms. But you could still have COVID if you just have conjunctivitis, feel really tired, have some aches and pains. If you have any symptoms of COVID, and I can't stress this enough, please get a test particularly in East London, but I'm sure across the UK, the voluntary sector, the NHS and the council are working really, really hard. It doesn't matter what you think of Dominic Cummings or the government, it is just really, really important that we get tested and if you're positive, you isolate for 14 days. Worry about everything else, how you're gonna pay for it afterwards, but do that isolation. Um, and it's sorry, Robin. I was going. I, I think the the issue probably for a lot of our viewers is going to be that so many of those symptoms are part of their everyday lives. How how might one make that distinction? You know, I wake up tired. I wake up aching all over, and I go to bed tired and aching all over. So I kind of know those things are there. Yeah, I think what what they've said a lot, especially around kind of the the cough. Um, and I think it goes through all of the symptoms, you know, if you normally have a cough, you know, if it's suddenly worse or more persistent than it normally is. Yes, it's about okay. subtle changes. I mean, I think you're yeah. right. We know our bodies very, very well, but it is about those subtle changes. I don't think there's any harm in being cautious. I mean, if I wake up with conjunctivitis, I haven't actually been out of the house since March. <laughs> Top of my list is not going to be a COVID test. If, on the other hand, I had had to go for an outpatient appointment 10 days ago, I would be straight on the phone whether or not it was a common symptom. But I think you're absolutely right. And in the past, I mean, I'm somebody who, if I get a cold, as soon as I start sneezing, I know I'm going to cough. I know I'm going to lose my throat, my voice and I know I'm going to be ill for at least three weeks. And I might get pneumonia. And if I get pneumonia... I might break ribs coughing. But there's other times I know I've got a virus and it, I've got no symptoms at all beyond feeling really, really tired and really, really achy. And, you know, there's a whole range of coronaviruses and rhinoviruses out there that cause coughs and colds. So that isn't really surprising. I think it just has to be, if in doubt, get a test and um, and do that in a really safe way. You know, get a home test if you don't have a car. Do not get on public transport. Do not get into a taxi. Like I say, I've met and worked with over the last few weeks lots of really hardworking people at every level at the council, every level at the voluntary sector, and there's going to be people like that across the UK. They're not taking holidays. They're not having a great time. And to be honest, it would be nice to know that it was safe to go out again sometime in the next 12 months from the point of view of us shielding. So yeah, I think let's all just try and cooperate. And rather than find reasons not to do it, you know, let's all try and find reasons to make this a big success because it's working an awful lot better in some much poorer countries, test and trace at the moment. And, you know, surely with all the resources we've got, we can make it work. Did anybody want to add anything? I think the only thing, I, I might have got it wrong, but I'm sure that on maybe Thursday's news last week, they talked about they'd open one of the 
new rapid testing centres in East Ham. We've had a testing centre here for about three weeks, or possibly longer, actually. I'm not sure. Mm. We're one of four boroughs with Brent, and I'm not sure of the other two but because we've had very very high rates of COVID here and very high death rates we're part of a group of boroughs where I think we kind of started the work before anybody else in the hope that we would learn some useful lessons because I think I was representing disabled people on some of those groups kind of certainly by the end of April beginning of May but yes, we've got we've got a local test centre. However, if like me, you need support to leave the house and haven't been out on your own for twenty years, the fact that there's a walk-in centre is not massively helpful. Yeah. But I you can post all kit. I'll, I'll be very quick on this. I don't know if it's improved any, but Tracy tried to get a postal COVID test um, just to, because. Um, and, and it was like a 16-page online questionnaire that she just wasn't able to fill in. So actually, mm. there's, there are barriers to getting absolutely, tests. Absolutely, absolutely. And I don't think anybody at any level would pretend otherwise. But I think the more we can try and make them work and feedback, you know, and if any of you have got these experiences, including Tracy, I know you're listening and you're able to drop me a line, one thing I can do is pass that straight back. And in fact, I spent an hour this morning having a meeting with a lovely woman called Elizabeth. And she indeed wants to talk to as many disabled people. This is in Newham, but beyond that as well, about what are the barriers to testing? What are the barriers to self-isolating if you're positive? So yeah, any thoughts you've got on test and trace, please send them to us. The address has just gone across at the bottom of the screen and it's info at together2012.org.uk. So we're going to get back to the arts with the slight thing that actually once we've shown you this film, we're going to finish today with our very own covered film, Charlie and the Sea Monsters. And we're going to talk a little bit more about how we made that, but also about how to do a close up in nature photography, particularly with Josh, who's been doing some brilliant things on the iPhone. But first, we're just going to show you this short film. Together 2012 is running a join in from home program from our website, together2012.org.uk. Click on the link at the top of the page, join in from home, to go straight to the main page where you have a wide range of accessible, inclusive, creative activities, mostly using things that you would already have at home. At the top of the page and throughout the pages, you will also see videos in British Sign Language to translate the site for deaf people. These videos can also be useful if you have difficulties reading and you simply want to hear more of the content. The Join In From Home programme is based on the activities that we would usually be running in East London. Dance Club usually meets on the fourth Monday of each month and they create improvised masked dance for the screen. Here you can also see their very first film where they simply made masks from paper plates, covered themselves with fabric and just moved gently to the music. You can hear as well there's a improvised soundtrack. So we're suggesting that you make a mask out of anything you can think of. It could be a cardboard box, a paper bag, a paper plate as in here. Video yourself dancing in it and then share the video with us. We will show it on screen and we will also enter it into the dance program of our film festival, which we run every December. If you're temporarily or permanently chair based, there's also a warm up you can do here created by our associate wheelchair dance company, Folk in Motion. And that focuses on relaxing your upper body and improving your breathing. The Photographers and Filmmakers Club usually meets on the second Monday of each month. 
we're inviting you to make a video at home with the theme of home and share it with us. You can use a phone or a camera, make any kind of film you wish, including drama, documentary, dance, animation, artist films, comedy, and they'll be eligible for a CAT award at our December Film Festival. You can also watch with us from home. In addition to Together 2012 TV with Together Unlocked and other live streams, we have the Together Disability Film Festival highlights. Each year we run the International Together Disability Film Festival in Stratford, bringing together a wide range of films by disabled filmmakers, as well as films about disability issues and disabled people. We always publish the programmes online with links to the films that are freely available. So we invite you to revisit our recent film festivals from the comfort of your own home and also to send us reviews of those films. And finally, you can sit back, relax and enjoy videos of past live performances, artist talks and creative workshops that we've produced in the past here. So, for example, from past festivals, we have documentation and films of creative dance workshops, street art performances, dances that the dance club have created, dance performances. And, of course, we're continuing to add new activities on a regular basis. This is all taking a little bit long to come back on, but that's just because it's hot. Yes, that's not even my fingers sticking to the computer. That is the internet just struggling to cope and I'm not surprised. So I think for once, all of the information about things you could just sit back and watch and listen to was more relevant in this heat than the things that you can actually actively get engaged in. I don't think many of us feel incredibly creative in the 30 degree heat. But what we did think would be interesting to talk about, as Judy was saying, is what do you do when you go outside, get a bit of fresh air, don't go very far, but you can still be creative. We've seen a number of artistic contributions from Josh, who started on this covered journey saying he was not an artist, but has been learning to draw taking films and taking some wonderful photographs, including his ones of thunderstorms. And if we do get some thunderstorms, I'm looking forward to trying so, some of those tips. So we might talk about that in a bit. But I wanted to show a photo on the stream we haven't seen before and just ask you to tell us a bit about how you took it. So for anybody who can't see, these are purple flowers with a bumblebee in the middle. And um, some of it's in focus and some of it isn't. The B is right in the centre and in sharp focus. Josh. Um, yeah, so I, uh, we talked a lot about kind of smartphone photography and iPhone photography. Um, I, I, I say cheated, I didn't cheat, um, but I took this on my uh, proper digital camera. So this wasn't, it's not an iPhone shot. Um, that was taken with a, a proper kind of 300 mil macro lens. Um, attached to my um, kind of SLR camera. Um, but yeah, it, it was very simply um, kind of sitting in the garden um, in the sun um, a little while ago, um, kind of looking at a lavender plant um, and waiting for a bee to finally land on it. I, initially, I tried to kind of follow the bee and then focus and take it um, but they were very kind of uncooperative uh, models. So <laughs> in the end, I decided to just pick a spot and just wait for a bee to land in it and then take a photo. Um, I was probably there for five or 10 minutes, took a couple of different tries. And um, some of them came out a bit blurry because the, the bee was moving and then kind of got that one where it had um, and settled kind of right in the middle of the, the shot. And, and yeah, was able to kind of get the, get the picture. Yeah, I found that was a really useful technique as well. And I'm sure not just if you're disabled with limited mobility, because I was videoing in. In fact, it kind of wasn't great because I was doing it from inside the house for various reasons. But 
I was looking at the honeysuckle just outside the window. And again, like you say, trying to follow the bees around. And then eventually you go, no, actually, the thing to do is get everything really sort of set up and let the camera focus and so on. And then wait for the insect to cooperate. Julie, um, Josh was talking about macro settings. Um, and it's something I kind of know a bit about. But it's one of those things, isn't it? If you're really going to take a close-up photograph the camera needs a special setting and in a sort of big camera a posh camera it's called a macro setting but on programs sometimes you just see an image that's supposed to be a flower really stylized don't you and if you swivel the dial to the flower it should set itself for really close-ups are you talking about a camera or are you talking about a phone phone because my, my phone doesn't have that but um well i was thinking more of the camera like you say with the slrs yeah for sure i think why that's useful is because it automatically sets the aperture um and one of the things about close-up photography is using for example an iphone um it's possible to enlarge a section that you're about to to photograph and take it that way. But what you lose is you lose a lot of the definition. A much better way of doing it is to take the camera closer to the item that you're going to be photographing. And that way you can always enlarge it and keep the definition. So you can enlarge it sort of like post taking the picture um, without losing anything. One of the things that, that Josh has done is very sensibly used a specific lens which allows you to get very, very close. As you can see, the lavender flowers, I wouldn't have automatically known it was a lavender. No. Um, and I'm actually not too bad on plants. Uh, but it's, it's isolated the area that Josh wanted to take a, a photograph of. And it's put it into sharp relief. And everything else becomes that beautiful photographic, sort of slightly blurred aspect to the picture. Um, and that's because, Josh, very sensibly, you used a specific lens for that. Um, you can also do something very similar at night. Uh, if you're looking at, at the moon, for example, um, you can get some really nice moon shots just using a, a standard telephoto lens. Um, but it's important to experiment. There isn't going to be, you're not going to become a good photographer what you will do is you'll become a photographer and if you enjoy it then your photographs will reflect that but the judgment comes from some sort of inside of yourself usually that says oh i don't i'm not, I'm not a very good photographer it's like i can't sing uh, most people can sing but it's a lack of confidence and the only way to get confident i found and i've been taking photographs sort of at, at, at a a significant level really since I was 18 but I still you know sometimes they work sometimes they don't but it's not the end of the world and sometimes you can really get an interesting image out of something that's gone wrong um so don't discard those those funny images yeah, we you know? talked a lot about that before haven't we I'm gonna take that photo down I mean I, you're right I haven't found a but I could be wrong, a specific setting for close-ups on the iPhone. I don't know about the Android. Have you found any close-up settings, Josh? I, I think, and it goes up to what Julie was saying, there's two different types of zoom. Um, so when you're using a camera, kind of like a, a, an SLR camera that's got a, a, a lens on it, um, it uses something called optical zoom, yes. um, which is when it's actually kind of magnifying the, you know, the, the, the lenses and the glass within the camera is what's creating that difference in, in distance. And um, what kind of the iPhones and smartphones do, because the lens can't move because it's you know, fitted to the back of the phone, um, is that it has something called a digital zoom. So you're basically... Oh, now, just to stop you both there, I'm not talking about zooming in. Because as Judy said, it's about often about getting the camera close. But the, the lens, most lenses, and you'll find this with both cameras and phones, if you get too close to an object, 
script, it's blurred. And what the macro setting does, or this close-up setting does, is allow the lens to kind of focus almost an inch away from you. So it's not using the zoom, it's actually a function of the focus. Now, I think this is a good opportunity. I'm just gonna put this into the stream that we I took last night, but I'm gonna try and mute it. That would be helpful, wouldn't it? So let's just move this around. So for anybody who can't see it, this is, well, basically water beasties. I have a half barrel pond in my garden, which if you watch on a Wednesday, our feature Nature Watch with assistance dog Precious, you may have noticed this rotten barrel in the corner. It's my wildlife pond. It's got wire over it to keep the dogs out. And the camera is just lying on that wire, essentially. And it's got a solar powered um, spotlight. So this is the spotlight in the water at night, attracting the little beasties to it. They're moving so fast that obviously not everything is in focus, but I was really impressed at just how much it did manage to get in focus. There's some little red lines sort of wriggling around, which I understand are called bloodworms from doing a little bit of research. There's some little bits dotting around which are called water fleas. And then there's some sort of strange things that go past and they seem to be larvae. I used to think before COVID that there was no point in doing things like Instagram because apart from work, I never really went out. And I think one thing for everybody shielding has been discovering what rich resources we have in our own backyards and indeed indoors. So that's my nature photography from inside. I know you said you'd had a look at it last night, Josh, when I put it onto Twitter. Yeah, it, it, I kind of saw it and um, it just popped up on my, my timeline. I was checking it just before I went to bed um, last night. Yeah, it was interesting to kind of see all the uh, kind of all the different species or bits and pieces. <laughs> the wee beasties. Um, yeah. The, the, yeah, all the, I the think of is the beasties. Um, Kind of okay. milling about. Do you, know, do you know what I think would be really good um, for someone other than me to do after the show? But in in terms of putting up on on in a related link somewhere, would be some kind of um, glossary list of all these names that we've been talking about. Like what is aperture? What's an SLR? What's macro? What's telephoto? Just you know, because those are people out there who. Are going to be thinking oh, i'd like to take that photo but do i need to know all these things and some you do and some you don't i just use a camera and hope it focuses you see <laughs> and i think that's a really important thing to say that very often these days the automatic settings will get you what you need because what you need is very very fast what josh was talking about was setting a photo up and waiting which is a bit different but most photos you take you'll see it your reach for your camera and the automatic settings are great. What we will do, as we say on our Join In From Home programme, there's a video out there about absolutely everything. We will find one and put it on our highlights and links page. Our highlights and links page will have links to everything we've talked about here, including the World Health Organization list of symptoms and Josh's photo and the little beast is wriggling around for anybody who wants to look at it. And we do that every time. It's under the main Together Unlocked TV highlights and links is just under that main menu. Right. But yes, I mean, I find all of these things confusing and I've been taking photos a lot since my late teens and I've exhibited some of them internationally as fine art ask me to define focal length, I would struggle. There you go. Let's ask Judy to define it. Why? <laughs> because you run the Together Photographers and Filmmakers Club, and there's just an outside chance you might be able to in language that the rest of us can understand. Oh, I'm going to get it wrong, and I know I am. I wasn't expecting this, but fundamentally, it's when you, when you take a photograph using a camera with lenses that you can adjust, what you want to do is you want to balance the settings so that the amount that the uh, the camera 
opens is in balance with the amount of light there is and at the point at which she wants something to be in focus. So, you know, if I want to take a, a picture of somebody standing in front of a mountain or sitting in front of a mountain, I don't necessarily want the mountains in focus, but I'll want the person in focus. And so I'll adjust the settings to allow for that, but still have the mountains tastefully sort of uh, in the background, but not not sharp. The sharp person will be the one that I've, I've adjusted the focal length for. And the aperture is this hole, isn't it, that it gets bigger or smaller, depending on how much light you need in, which depends on how much light there already is. Yeah, well, I mean, you can adjust it, but yes, for sure. If it's if it's uh, an automatic setting, then that, that happens automatically. It sort of balances. There's a little chip in the camera that balances the light and the um, the the bit that's in focus, the bit that you're actually, if you've got a digital camera, you can actually, you've got a bit on the screen or the, the center of the lens, which indicates that this is what you're going to take a photograph of. I, guess I think sometimes it, it is all like, good photographs sometimes really come down to luck um, and willing participants. I don't know if you've got access to the picture of the bird that I sent you the other day, um, but I hadn't gone out to photograph a bird. I, I, I actually dropped Josh at the hospital and I was waiting and I suddenly saw this bird that's about that big, you know, sitting on this post. And I'm like, okay, I'll drive close and see what it does. And it stood there. So I took a picture through the window and then I thought, okay, well, maybe the window will distort it a bit. It's going to fly off if I open the window, round the window down. And this bird just sat there about that far from me. Sorry, that way, like <laughs> that far from me. <laughs> um, just like happy as you like and just let me take its photo. I don't even know what bird it is. I think it's a crow or a raven, but. Um, what, but what's yeah, what's quite interesting with that was that the because you were focused on the bird, the camera ignored the window of your car and took the photograph of the bird. Uh, so that, that, that wasn't relevant to the camera and the little chip. Yeah, I mean, I think unless you are an absolute superstar and also, yes, shall we say, kind of, very, very controlling. These days, for most things, the computers are just so much better at it than we yeah. are. If you want special effects, that's when it's really worth learning how to control it. And again, if you're feeling like you want to do some photography, but you don't want to do anything original, that's the time to get onto YouTube, sit back. There's loads of great photographers doing fantastic videos, and it's a great way to learn. I mean, I don't suppose you can imagine the world we grew up in where you couldn't just put on YouTube and find a video. But um, but it's still quite amazing to us, isn't it? That there's so much out there so easily. And we do actually, I don't know if anybody noticed, but we do actually say that on the film section of the Join In From Home programme. It's not how expensive your phone or your camera is. It's what you do with it. So. Yeah, I think it's really important, just quickly, because I'm conscious of the time, you know, if you go online around kind of photography things, th there's almost a certain uh, kind of snobbery if you use the automatic settings, you're not a real photographer. It's like, well, actually, when you learn, you know, when you, you are starting to you know, do it for the first time, it, those automatic settings are there for a reason. You know, they haven't just kind of thrown something together and got that'll do some professional when they've made the camera have set it up exactly on the landscape oh, or whatever absolutely Why not and, use it? and then when you do start to learn all the, the technical things about shutter speed and whatever then you can start doing your own stuff but actually there's nothing wrong with those preset ones because you know they're there for a reason I think that's a really interesting idea. It's not the computer, it's the synthesis of loads of human beings. But also, I mean, I started my paid career as a journalist and the sort of journalist, which was unusual in those days, who took their own photographs. 
if you're taking news photographs, you don't start messing around with the shutter speed unless you've been up a ladder for two hours. And like you say, you know, you're waiting, if you like, for the equivalent of the bumblebee to come along and you know that it's going to be really, really challenging. But usually it's about they're coming in, you've got to take a photo. And that's the kind of photography I'm most interested in. It's seeing pictures that are already there. You know, life has made a picture. Nature has made a picture. Sometimes, actually, when nature's made a picture, I think this is too good to take a photograph. I would rather enjoy it. But otherwise, I will just pick up the camera. Or if something is fun, if anybody follows us on Twitter, I put up a picture which has also been liked on the Together account. Julie was coming up into the studio. The cat sat on the roof of the lift. She couldn't move. She was stuck between floors. She begged me to come and move the cat, so I took a photograph first. Now, I wouldn't have had time to start fiddling with the settings, even if I could have got a better photograph, which I probably could have done, because by that point, even the cat would have gone. So it, it really is horses for courses. I mean, as a portrait photographer, again, I like really, really natural in the moment, preferably not set up at all. But if you want to control every single element and enter your portraits for the National Portrait Prize each year, then yes, you probably will be expected to, if not to have everything in focus and shop, to know why, you know, to have yeah. deliberately made those decisions. Can, so, I, yeah. can I just sort of, as a, as a final thing, it's possible on eBay to get a, um, a light meter for a couple of quid. Um, and once you've bid successfully on it and got it sent to you, put it into quarantine for a few days until it's safe to open, then play with it because that will teach you more about light values and speeds and all sorts. You don't have to use it specifically attached to a camera, but if you play with it at different parts of the house and different lights, etc., you know, for the sake of a couple of quid, you've got something in your hand that will actually teach you something. Once you've got a, an idea of what you're looking at, then you can start to read up on it or go to YouTube. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. So I want to start drawing things to a close because we're going to show the full version with audio description of our Charlie and the Sea Monsters film. One of the reasons, apart from the resurgence in COVID, that I wanted to show this is the last two weeks we've talked quite a lot about how to make a film out of your still photographs and with sound that you found online. And this little film is really the audio described version of a colouring book. We brought out Charlie and the Sea Monsters as a print your own comic and colouring book at the beginning of July, on um, 6th of July, in fact, when shielding was eased for the first time. It's available on our website under Charlie and the Sea Monsters. You can print it out. It's 16 A4 pages colour it in, we'd love to see photographs of what you've done. But it's not much use if you're blind or visually impaired. So we took the drawings, and there are 40 drawings, and we turned it into this little film using sound effects that I found online. We've talked about this in an earlier programme in more detail, but it's actually exactly the same principle as when we looked at Julie's film last week of the Snaps from Broadstairs Folk Festival when she'd montaged them. The only thing that we haven't done is use the effect that you were talking about where the camera moves around in a slideshow. For this, it was just really important that you simply saw the photographs. But you'll see we've still faded some or dissolved them rather into the other. It hasn't simply been a straightforward edit. And the timing is not dissimilar to a slideshow, although this was um, actually edited in Final Cut Pro. So on Wednesday, like we say, we have our clockwork Paralympics for the right of the teddy bear to wear a gold medal. Julie, I don't know if you'd like to hold Anna wearing a medal for the last time. We join in the worldwide virtual bear hunt each week. So we have a new teddy bear for you each week. Like I say, we've got 
Nature Watch. In fact, Nature Watch with Merlo Plurger, the assistance dog who is currently on his holidays and has just sent me a video from the Suffolk Woods. So Precious is going to be a bit jealous because we have a new dog on pet cam this Wednesday. Precious will be thrilled. It's much too hot for her at the moment. <laughs> yeah, I suppose there is that. So um, we're looking forward to seeing that. But for all of you who are artists, much more importantly, we will have the Pop-Up Poetry Club with poems written this week on the theme of positive and negative and at the same time. So it just leaves us to say from a very, very hot East London, it's about 35 outside and it's over 30 degrees in the studio. What's it? What's the temperature in the West Midlands? 28, 29, I think. Oh, we're jealous. We're jealous. So we'll see you all on Wednesday at three o'clock. And in a minute, this will be Charlie and the Sea Monsters. In the city not far away, Charlie and the other residents were going about their business. Unaware that getting closer and closer, there was a strange monster. With a kiss, little monsters leapt off the big monster and started climbing into Charlie's mouth. Charlie carried on his way, talking into his phone. Unseen, little monsters come out of Charlie's mouth as he's speaking and fly into the face of the woman walking past. Charlie spits as he carries on. Little monsters play in the spit and jump onto a passing wheel. A wheelchair user pushes on unaware. Little monsters climb onto her hands from the wheels. Meanwhile, Charlie goes into the store. Little monsters are left on the handle of the door where he's pushed it open. Next, a little girl comes into the store. Her hands touch the same handle and the monsters jump onto her arm. As she touches her face, one climbs onto her nose. Charlie is in the store picking up tins from the shelf to have a closer look. When he puts them back, they're covered with little monsters. Charlie chats in the queue as he waits to pay, and little monsters fly out with every word. Outside, the little girl is playing ball with a friend. Little monsters climb from her hands onto the ball. And climb onto the hands of the friend she's playing with. Meanwhile, Charlie gets onto the bus. He leaves little monsters behind where he touches the rail. The monsters climb onto the hands of the next person to get onto the bus. Back home, Charlie chats to a neighbour who's putting out her bin. And then has a chat with his next door neighbour. Back at home, the lady on the bus is washing her hands.
and so is the child who was playing ball. And so is the wheelchair user who's also scrubbing the wheels. In the soap bubbles, the monsters die. But other people Charlie met are now ill. Charlie himself is very ill. <laughs> and while a neighbour's still fine, she has lots of little monsters coming out of her whenever she speaks. And there are still monsters on the shop handle. And on the shop tins. and on the rail in the bus. But one of Charlie's friends is safe at home listening to the radio. And puts a mask on when they go out. <laughs> and keeps as far away from other pedestrians as they can. And washes their hands when they get home, which kills the monsters. Story and Sound, Q90, <coughs> Artwork, Stickman Communications Limited. <coughs> Together 2012, Creative Commons 2020. <coughs>